Grace and peace, everyone. I am here today to share my testimony with you. And in sharing, I just want to point out two things. I won't be mentioning anyone by name because I believe that the essence of my experience was not necessarily based on the who, but the fact that the body of Christ assisted. I won't necessarily mention my blood relatives because, again, I believe that this was an experience that was spiritual and uh, had uh, to do with something that God wanted to teach me. I am sharing with you today my love story, a practical demonstration of how the body cares for its own. This is an account of my own experience of the very strong support system that exists within the body and my firm affirmation in the concept that sometimes you have to be carried. This phenomenon is by no means easy as I was boxed into a socially limited space, colored and shaped by events of the past as well as my extremely strong independent traits. I had over time concretized and mastered the habit of self-reliance and a belief in the notion that I can do it by myself. My outlook was based on personal challenges and inhibitions, but thank God that I got an opportunity to have a front row seat to witness how the body operates. I am a practical person and I learn best by observation. So God in his wisdom placed me in a group where I could visibly see him at work. After all, the Bible says that we are God's hands and feet extended. And so God uses people to execute his plans and demonstrate his love. This group of saints is called the Micro Setup Group, or Team Micro. And we come together every Saturday evening, pre-COVID, to prepare the sanctuary for Sunday morning worship. So we would gather the chairs, arrange them and clean them off, and do the floral arrangements and whatever it took just to make the sanctuary ready. The members of the group are from various backgrounds and each is unique in their own way. But one thing is common, and that is the genuine care for the members of the body of Christ. Such care would be seen in members of Team Michael as you would hear them give account of them transporting members of the body to, receive, to hospitals to receive emergency care at various hours of the night. They would speak about accompanying members to doctor's appointments or medical treatment, preparing food packages, providing advice, whatever it took. This was meted out to any member of the body who needed help and not just close friends. My eyes were now opened and I began to see how the Lord expects the body to work and over time I too became involved as I began to experience God in a whole new way. Little did I know that I would soon be on the receiving end of such kindness. In October 2020, I began to feel severe numbness and cramps in my right leg, which was an issue I had experienced months before as a result of injuries I sustained in a motor vehicle accident. However, with physical therapy and medications, I thought I had jumped over that hurdle. But this level of discomfort was an indication, indication sorry, that I needed medical attention. I reluctantly made an appointment to see the neurologist whose care I was under. And he recommended that I do a lumbar spine MRI to see what was happening. And I pause here to say that before my interaction with this team, Michael, 
when I got the referral, I would just go ahead and probably just Google the doctor to see, to just verify some stuff and, and go ahead. But this time when I got the referral, I actually called someone who is uh, in the medical field from this church just to run it by, by her. And, you know, her instruction then was, hold on, let me, let me get back to you on it. Don't move from where you are. Long and short, she got back within about 20 minutes to refer me to a neurologist. And it was a Wednesday, probably about 3 o'clock. And I went to the neurologist, and I got to see him actually at about 4.30. And you're talking about a system where they work by appointments, and I actually got to see him, which was something very good for me. Now, my first MRI, when I went to do it, that was in 29, I went alone, I went by myself, and that didn't go too well. So when he told me that I needed to do another MRI, I told members of Team Michael what was happening, and someone agreed to accompany me. When I arrived for my appointment, three members of the body were there to support me. One was allowed inside the room where the scan was being done, and although I was enclosed in what I call a coffin, it was really comforting to know that I had support in the room. All this time, my frailty was on display as my true self was being revealed in front of persons who may have thought that I had it all together. I was an emotional wreck, just preparing to do the scan. And this state intensified as I awaited the results, which was to be emailed to me by 1.30 the following day. On the Saturday evening, as I was getting ready to go to Michael, I checked my email, and sure enough, the results were in. As I began to read the report, I was seeing words like mass and tumor, and my whole world became a haze of thoughts, and then I became an internet doctor. But that only aroused my curiosity and caused me to be thinking all sorts of things. Needless to mention, my intense weeping but I managed to compartmentalize my situation and eventually went to Michael, aided by a peak hat and the mandatory mask, which both acted as a good cover to my distress. That worked on the Saturday, but on the Sunday, I didn't have the peak hat, but the mask plus my glasses are also good decoys, or so I thought. I had taken the decision to wait for my doctor's appointment on the Wednesday before I shared the information. So up to that time on the Sunday, I had only discussed the result with one person. On the Sunday, however, when I arrived at church, I made a conscious attempt to try to be my usual self. However, during the service, the father of group Michael came over to me and asked me if I was okay. I replied, yes, but he firmly said to me, no, Pat, you are not okay. So much for the mask and the glasses. I guess nothing could hide the state I was in. I knew at this point that I needed to share the information. So after church, I shared it with two other persons, and so the journey began. Wednesday seemingly took forever to come, but it eventually did, and it was time for my doctor's appointment where the scan would be read and the diagnosis given. For this appointment, I was again accompanied by two persons, one of which was now a staple in my, staple in my life and who eventually came in with me to see the doctor. The diagnosis was not good as he explained what was happening. However, he needed the benefit of another MRI to validate his assumptions. So another time in the coffin, but this time it would be almost half an hour. 20 minutes first and then a dye would be applied and I would have to go back in for an additional six or so minutes. So the troop was rallied up and this time for my 8 a.m. Saturday morning appointment, five persons accompanied me with one person coming inside the room where the scan was being done. I did not make the same mistake with the results. This time I told them to email it directly to the doctor as I did not want anything to put me in further distress. So I tried to dismiss my reality and awaited my doctor's appointment. 
However, while I waited, one morning as I was having a shower, I noticed three big dark circles on my right hand, which was, which was an indication to me, I believe that God was showing me to prepare myself. Anyway, I went to the doctor again, accompanied by my support, and the doctor explained what was happening. There was a benign tumor which was pressing against the nerve in my lower back, resulting in the numbness and pain in my right leg. Based on where the tumor was located, it was a bit obscured. So the doctor could not determine if it was growing from the bone or on the nerve itself. However, surgery was required. All right, so as I prepared for surgery, in talking to the doctor to, dis to discuss what was happening, naturally the concern would be if there's any chance of paralysis because of the proximity to my spinal cord. However, he explained that he had done it before. So I'm a praying woman. I just need to trust the Lord. So what I was facing was if it was on the nerve, he would have to shave it down as close as possible. If it was on the bone, then he would try to remove it. But all of this was uncertain until he actually went in. The doctor advised that the operation be done as quickly as possible, so I needed to, to decide if it was to be done before Christmas or shortly after, but certainly by mid-January. This was now late November, so I didn't have much time to play with, and at this point, the doctor could not tell me how much the procedure would cost. Anyway, he promised to write to the insurance company to get pre-approval of coverage. On December 1, 2020, I received an email from the doctor with a confirmation of the pre-approval for the payment and a note to say he would call me to discuss. When I examined the invoice, the operation was costing approximately $3.3 million, $2.6 being covered by the insurance and the remaining $700 to be paid by me. The next morning, I received a call from the doctor and he inquired if I had seen the email to which I con confirmed receipt. He then said that he would do the surgery the next Friday, December 11th, which is his last surgery date for the year. I told him no because it was too quick and I had to get things in order, including receiving approval for my sick leave from my employer and naturally the money. I proposed the Monday after Christmas for the surgery as this would allow me to enjoy Christmas, Christmas and hopefully be out of the hospital before New Year's Day. However, he explained that it would be difficult as most doctors take a break during that time of year. So he reassured me of his previous promise to me that he would do the surgery whenever I was ready. So we agreed on December 18th. When I asked him about the money, because I mean, this is like two weeks away and you don't ask me about your money. He said that all I needed to do was to pay the hospital fee of $140,000, as that had to be paid upfront prior to admission, and then I can work out a, an arrangement with him. He wasn't interested in the money at that time. Needless to say, two weeks to get things in order was a huge task. During that time, I received my sick leave approval for six weeks, which in and of itself is a blessing as this exceeded my allotment. The other part of my preparation was taken over by my team, and I was literally being carried by my friends from this assembly. The only thing that I purchased for the hospital was literally two nightgowns, and even in making the purchase, my team accompanied me. Everything I needed was provided, even things that I had for myself like towels and rags. God showed up with 50% of the required 700000 and I was able to pay the entire hospital bill and pay 50% of the doctor's fee. And this was after I negotiated with God about some money he provided the same month in November. 
And I had to say to him, imagine you give me the money and you're going to take it right back. But he provided. I was required to check into the hospital by noon on December 17th as I had lab work to do in preparation for the surgery the following day. So in the on the morning of the surgery, I moved into my temporary home where I would recover post-surgery. And this is part of the love which was poured out to me. I could not care for myself, and so my lovely friend graciously opened up her house to me, and by extension, the team of persons who would assist me during my recovery. Now I was on my way to the hospital, accompanied by my team of seven persons. Only one person was allowed inside at the point of admission, and so that person who I assigned as my next of kin sent me, went with me to the room and ensured that I was okay while the others waited outside. Thankfully, I had a room with a window to the car park, so I was able to wave to them. I had one other angel who works at the hospital, and she would also check in with me very regularly to ensure that I was doing okay. The hours leading up to the operation was very long, and in, I did not sleep at all. And then the day finally came, and then the hours leading up to it was fastly approaching. The surgery was scheduled for 8 a.m., and by 7 a.m., my two next of kings, both from this assembly, were with me, and this provided great comfort. My doctor also visited me before the operation, and this also provided a little re relief as I saw him in his usual shirt and tie and not in scrubs. There was a delay for the surgery, so I didn't leave the ward until about 8.15. But my next of kings, both of them, followed me as far as they could at the operating theatre and constantly reassured me that it was going to be okay. The operation was a major success, as the doctor confirmed that it was not a tumor but instead an unusual overgrowth of veins which were pressing against the nerve. So now I was in recovery mode and was discharged one day sooner than planned from the hospital. Again, I was picked up, by, picked up from the hospital by my group of friends and taken to my recovery home. A roster system was in place for my care with persons being assigned to help me for the next four weeks. This meant that persons took time off from work or utilized work from home privileges to see to my well-being. In the early part of my recovery, I could not help myself and so I had to be taken care of. The day would start with, my, with me taking my first set of meds at 7.30 a.m. and by this time my caregiver for the day would have arrived and was, uh, and was ready to assist me in taking a bath and caring for me. The rest of the day, I would be assisted in whatever way, including going to the bathroom, getting my meals and whatever. I had overwhelming support from not only my immediate team that was around me, but from so many others who called to check up on me who prepared food, who visited me, even though I had to deliberately curtail my visitors based on the realities of the COVID pandemic. And for this, I'm very thankful. God has truly been good to me. And I want to say that I was on the receiving end because I allowed myself to open up to my church family. It was not always like this. I was involved in church, but never really allowed persons to enter my personal space. Most of my closest friends did not even attend this assembly, but over time I learned how to trust people. When I had the accident, it, occur it occurred at the gate of someone that I was close to, but my instruction from the Lord in that time of emergency was to call someone I had just left at church. And within minutes, several of my church family members arrived and helped through the process, including staying with us at the hospital. And even one member stayed home and prepared a home-cooked meal that when we left the hospital, we could go home and have something to eat. Finally, I want to say to you that everything you need is in the body of Christ. 
Some of us will be the hands that will help to hold and lift up a brother in need. Some will be the tongue to speak life into our being and to offer words of encouragement. Some will be the shoulder we can lean on when we need support. Some will be the feet that will walk with you in your time of need and will come to find you to offer help. We all have our part to play as we seek to care for each other. This is my love story, an experience that I could not have paid for for people to administer to me, but I'm thankful that people right here at the Grace Workshop showed up and helped, helped me. Open up your hearts today and reach out to someone in need. When the announcements go out, think about what you can do in playing your part in helping a brother or sister to overcome. This is what the body of Christ should do and this is what the Lord requires of us. So let us show the body to the body a practical approach.